All right, Redeemer, uh, if you have your Bibles, I'd invite you to turn to 1 Samuel 17. 1 Samuel 17. It's a long chapter, and uh, I'm going to read it all and uh, try to have us done by noon. So it's a long chapter, and uh, just pray for me. One of the exhortations that Paul gave to Timothy was that he would devote himself to the public reading of God's word. So there's something powerful and beautiful about reading long chapters that in Paul's day that they didn't have Bibles. Everyone didn't have it. And so uh, you probably had a, a Bible in a church and as pastors would read, people would linger and think on it. And so we're going to read. We're going to read uh, 58 verses and I invite you to follow along with me and I'm praying God's blessing on the reading and hearing of it. Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle, and they were gathered at Sokah, which belongs to Judah, and encamped between Sokah and Ezekah in Ephes Damim. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered and encamped in the valley of Elah, and they drew up line of battle against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with the valley between them. And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion, and his name was Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had a bronze armor on his legs and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of the spear was like a weaver's beam and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron and his shield bearer went before him. He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and you are not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all of Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now David was the son of an Ephrathite of Bethlehem in Judah named Jesse, who had eight sons. In the days of Saul, the man was already old and advanced in years. The three oldest sons of Jesse had followed Saul to the battle, and the names of his three sons who went to battle were Eliab, the firstborn, and next to him Abinadab, and the third Shammah. David was the youngest. The three eldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. And for 40 days, the Philistine came forward and took his stand morning and evening. And Jesse said to David, his son, take for your brothers an ephah of this parched grain and these 10 loaves and carry them quickly to the camp to your brother's. Also take these ten cheeses to bring to the commander of their thousand. See if your brothers are well and bring some token from them. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. And David arose early in the morning and he left the sheep with a keeper and took provisions and he went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the encampment as the host was going out to the battle line, shouting the war cry in Israel, and the Philistines drew up for battle, army against army. And David left the things in charge of the keeper of the baggage, and he ran to the ranks and went and greeted his brothers. As he talked with them, behold, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came up out of the ranks of the Philistines, and he spoke the same words as before. And this time David heard him. And all of the men of Israel, when they saw the man, they fled from him and were much afraid. And the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel and the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. And David said to the men who stood by, what shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach of Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? 
And the people answered him in the same way, so shall it be done to the man who kills him. Now Eliab, David's eldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, Why have you come down? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your presumption and the evil of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. And David says, What have I done now? Was it not but a word? And he turned away from him toward another and spoke in the same way, and the people answered him again as before. When the words that David spoke were heard, they repeated them before Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and will fight this Philistine. And Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight him, for you are but a youth, and he has been a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he rose against me, I caught him by the beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go, and may the Lord be with you. Then Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a helmet of bronze on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. And David David strapped his sword over his armor, and he tried in vain to go, for he had not tested them. Then David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested these. So David took them off. Then he took his own staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the brook, and he put them in his shepherd's pouch. His sling was in his hand, and and he approached the Philistine. And the Philistine moved forward and came near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth, ruddy, and he was handsome in appearance. And the Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you should come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the air and the beasts of the field. And David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down, and I will cut off your head, and I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword or spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will not and he will give you into our hand. And when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell on his face to the ground. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and struck the Philistine, and he killed him. And there was no sword in the hand of David. Then David ran and stood over the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. And the men of Israel and Judah rose with a shout and pursued the Philistines as far as Gath and the gates of Ekron so that the wounded Philistines fell on the way to Sharim as far as Gath and Ekron. And the people of Israel came back from chasing the Philistines, and they plundered their camp. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem. But he put his armor in his tent. As soon as Saul saw David go out against the Philistine, he said to Abner, the commander of his army, Abner, whose son is this youth? And Abner says, as your soul lives, O king, I do not know. 
And the king said, Inquire whose son the boy is. And as soon as David returned from striking down the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. And Saul said to him, Whose son are you, young man? And David answered, I am the son of your servant, Jesse, the Bethlehemite. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Lord, your word is like a movie. Twists and turns and surprise endings and fear and victory. And yet it's not make-believe. No person, no human wrote this story. This is a story from the counsel of God Almighty. It's a story that we find ourselves a part of in some way. Lord, I pray that as your word has been read, that you will actually bless it to our bodies and our souls. I pray that you will take us from being a fearful people to a people who have found beautiful freedom in you, that we might encounter whatever we encounter in this life. May we do it not in our own strength, but with the help and the presence and the promises of God. Speak through your servant. Your people are listening. I pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. So I want to show you uh, that there is fear in this passage. I also want to show you that there is also waiting in this passage. As God's people find themselves waiting on a deliverer. And as we think about Advent, those two things are uh, a part of it. That if we're really, really honest, uh, there are many things out there that makes us afraid. And if we find ourselves being honest about this longing, this waiting, this waiting on someone to come and to make things right, we realize that we have more in common with the people of Israel than we often believe. Paul Tripp speaks about fear as being a gift of God to us. And he says that there are three types of fear. One is a fear of God. This is a holy reverence of him that moves us to worship and enjoy and obey him. But he also speaks of a fear, uh, of a, a rapid response fear. And this is the fear that you feel, maybe you're a parent and you see your kid about to hurt themselves and you just, you, you jump into action to protect them without even having to think about it. You're driving a car and someone cuts in front of you and you jam the brakes and you put your hand up as a husband over here to kind of guard your wife from kind of going forward. It's that rapid response fear. You don't have to think about it. It just happens. And then there is what Tripp calls an appropriate concern. It's the fear or that the sobriety that we have when we face hard things in life with this God-given ability to analyze. We can make wise decisions and planned choices to protect life, ourselves, and those we love. But he makes a distinction that we can be given over to fear. And this happens when we meditate exclusively on the trouble we face, and we forget that God is in it with us. This type of fear, it, it thinks more about the things that we might endure and less about the God who is with us, the God who is present. And I wonder if we find ourselves there this Advent season. You watch the news and you see statistics, and your heart begins to think and become consumed about everything else out there. And God is sort of kind of pushed out of the way. If that's you this morning, I have good news for you. I want to tell you about a king who has come to slay a giant who mitigates our fear, and he gives you freedom. Freedom right here and right now and in the face of whatever might come your way. That's where Israel is right here. There's a frightening foe that's causing deep fear in Israel. That's the first point. If you look at our text, you'll notice that fear actually shapes it. You'll see it right there in verse 11. When Saul and all of Israel heard these words, 
they were dismayed and greatly afraid. You see it again in verse 24. All of the men of Israel, that they saw this man, they fled from him, and they were much afraid. That you see it, that, that they are crippled on the battlefield, and nothing physical has happened to them. Their hearts have been taken that their hearts have, are, at this moment are being owned by this terrifying giant in front of them. He's taken their hearts from him. Now, what makes him terrifying? His terrifying appearance, his terrifying heart, and his terrifying proposal. That when you look at how Goliath is introduced uh, right there in verses 3, all the way down and really until verse 11, and then David is introduced in verse 12, you, you really do get this image of a, a, a ring announcer. So you, you've, you've probably watched boxing, and I'm not talking about the boxing last week where Nate Robinson got knocked out or Mike Tyson fought. N not that. I mean like a real boxing match where you have a ring announcer who says, in the corner to my right, we have the defending champion. You'll notice that two times in this passage, Goliath is called the champion. So he is, he is like the undisputed heavyweight champion of the world. And he comes in, if you do the calculations, he's probably nine feet, nine inches tall. He's a giant, maybe weighing 400, 500 pounds. And the armor, the, 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 the intricacy in which his armor is described, it's of bronze. It's a coat of males, which would have been bronze beaten and then overlaid on top of each like scales of a fish. And, and it went down to probably his thigh. And then he had parts of his armor that came up to his knee. And then his javelin was made out of bronze. And it was like a weaver's beam. And the, the tip on the javelin is probably 20 pounds. And his armor is probably 187 pounds. And on top of this, he has an armor bearer who goes in front of him. And his only job is to hold up the armor for this guy who is already invincible. And so when Israel sees this, this figure, they are dismayed that everybody's running, including Saul. They're terrified of his appearance. They're terrified of his heart. Some form of defy is used over and over again in this passage. Look at verse 10. The Philistine said, I defy, I rebel, I publicly rebel against the ranks of Israel this day. You see it down there in verse 24. Surely he has come to defy Israel. You see it again in verse 26. He is defying the armies of the living God. You see it over in verse 36. He has defied the armies of the living God. You see it again in verse 45. You're defying the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel. This guy is a defiant bully who wants to enslave Israel. He's like Pharaoh, only he's Pharaoh in Judah's land. They left Egypt that belonged to Pharaoh. They're coming into the land of promise, and this portion of land they're fighting on, it's actually Judah's. And so this bully is trying to enslave them in the land that God has given them. And he wants to fight to the death. Somebody dying a day is what he's saying. And then look at his terrifying proposal. He is so cocky, so arrogant, that he will be the last man standing. That he says, okay, I'm, I'm so good and so hood and so gangster and so skilled. Let's do away with uh, us fighting each other. How about you? Israel, go get your best warrior, your best king, your best army, and you put your best against me. And if I win, and I, I'm going to kill your guy, and when I kill him, you're our servants. But if your guy happens to kill me, then we're your servants. He wants what I would call representative combat. Send me your best. I send you my best. 
and the best man wins and the people are blessed through the victory of the representative. That's what he's putting before them. We may not be stationed there on the mountain of Sukkah, looking in the valley of Elah and beholding a nearly 10-foot giant. But we're like Israel. We have giant threats around us in this life. And as you survey the Bible, you will discover that God's people are fought, are taunted, are mocked, and at times, God's people are beheaded, John the Baptist. At times, Nebuchadnezzar sets cities and people on fire in the Bible. You'll meet John the Baptist whose head is put on a platter. You'll meet Lamech in Genesis who writes a song about murder. You'll hear about God's apostles being persecuted and killed. The Bible is a book about darkness and about evil and about bullies. It's a book about giants and dragons and serpents who talk. It's a book about locusts in the book of Revelation who have faces like humans, who move in battle like horses, who have teeth like lions. It's a book about beasts who come out of the sea with ten heads and, 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 and ten horns and seven heads and blasphemous names are on its heads. It's a book about a dragon who actually wants to devour and chew up and eat up a son born of a woman. Like, like don't think that this book is it, that, that persecution and violence and bullying is not here. It's all over it. That our world is cruel and we're up against formidable foes. Scholars would say that, that believers, we battle this threefold enemy. It's the flesh, and I want you to remember this, the flesh, the world, and the devil. Now, where are they getting that from? They're getting that from passages like Ephesians 2. Listen to me. We at one time followed the course of the world, following the prince of the power of the air, that's Satan, the spirit who is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body, by nature, we were children of wrath. And so what Paul is saying in Ephesians 2 is that there is this threefold enemy. It's the flesh, it's the world, and it's the devil. And then Paul adds another one in 1 Corinthians. And that other enemy is death. And so I want you to use your imagination. No, we're not there and then standing in a, on a mountain looking into a valley, looking at this 10-foot giant but we do battle against a four-headed monster. And it's the flesh. And it's the world. And the thinking of the world. And the ways of the world. And it's the devil who is a roaring lion. And it's death. And there are times when one of the heads of that dragon, it attacks you. And it may not be all three. Satan may not be near you and attacking you. And your flesh may be at bay for a day. And this world loses its luster. You can see through the lies and the deception. And then you get a phone call that your mother died of COVID. And the four-headed monster has struck. And there's a day when no one you personally knows dies and your flesh is at bay. 
and Satan is at bay, but this world around you, you see the injustice, you see the inequity, you see the alluring and the over-promising and the appealing nature of it. You see your own friends and your own soul and your own children going after the way of this world. And the four-headed dragon has struck. And there are days when the world is not alluring And Satan is at bay, and no one you know dies, but then it's your own flesh. You look up one day, and you're lusting, and you're prideful, and you're discontent, and you're anxious, and you're haughty, and you're boastful, and you're mean. And the four-headed dragon struck And there are days when you don't know anyone who's dying. Your flesh is good. You're not being allured by the world. And then Satan shows up. An evil spirit, or he sends his minions. And it's supernatural. And it's dark. And you can't put your finger on it, but you know, like Luther did, He's near and he's working. And I pity the day when all four converge on you at the same time. You see, any one of those beasts, any one of the heads of that beast can take you out of here. Paul says Demas was in love with this present world. Jesus tells Peter, Get behind me, Satan. Paul says in Romans chapter 7, I do not understand what I do. The good that I want to do is not what I do. The evil that I do not want to do, that's what I find myself doing. He says, I am convinced that nothing good dwells in my flesh. And which one of us in this room thinks we have the power to conquer physically dying? Any one of those on your worst day, can cause you panic and fear. It's bigger than us, and they're stronger than us, and we're like the people of Israel. If we remove God from our worldview, God from our lives, that's us right here. And then you get our second point. This faithful, unassuming, and rejected fighter. That I really do think a comparison is happening here. That this ring announcer is saying in, in these verses, in, in verse 17, kind of chapter 17, verses 3 all the way through 10 and 11, that he's given us this depiction of Goliath, and then he switches and starts talking to us about David. And think about it. In this right corner, we have Goliath, and these are his credentials. And in the left corner over here, we have nobody. You know how long nobody showed up to the fight? It says Goliath did this for 40 days. 40 days, he got up morning and evening and says, who's going to fight me? And for 40 days, No one got in the ring, not Saul, not David's three brothers who were mentioned here by name. These were the same brothers that Jesse tried to get Samuel to anoint in the previous chapter. These same three brothers are in this chapter. And guess what? Ain't none of them in the ring to go against Goliath. And so for 40 days, the taunting happens. For 40 days, no one stands up for God's name and the good of God's sheep until a DoorDash delivery guy shows up. You know what DoorDash is? You buy food from, let's say, a char or let's say, you know, a restaurant. DoorDash will go pick it up and will bring it to your house. That's how David gets in the ring, y'all. Did y'all hear this? He was keeping sheep while his other brothers went to the battle. And it's actually David's dad who says, hey, go take these parched grain, go take this cheese and go take this bread and go run it over here to your brothers. 
and let me know how they're doing and then bring me some token that they're still alive. And Dave, so Dave, that, that's what Dave is doing. He's a DoorDash delivery dude who just happens to go there and he hears, he, he hears, he hears the words coming from the mouth of Goliath and it stops him in his tracks. Okay, did, 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 did I just hear him say that? Here, here, here's the food. Did I just hear him say that? Ain't nobody going to shut his mouth. He is profaning the name of God, and he has God's people captive to fear. This is not how we live. So you tell me, what does the killer of this fool get for killing him? Well, if you want to know what, what has been promised, you have been promised wealth. You've been promised the wife a wife from the daughter of Saul, and you've been promised freedom, which we think is freedom from the family unit of the one who can kill Goliath from being taxed by Saul. And you'll notice in the next chapter, David actually gets to marry Saul's daughter. So David is showing up like, okay, I'm going to do this, and you tell me what I get for doing it. And he's not believed in by men. Did you notice what his oldest brother said to him? Eliab, look at verse 28. His anger is kindled against David. Why have you come down here? Who, who, who you left those few sheep with in the wilderness? I know your heart, the evil in your heart. You've come down here to see the battle and to spy. And David's like, come on, man. I just said something. What, what, what's the big deal here? Why are you picking on me, right? Like, that's the, the language here. And then David says, okay, whatever, dude. Back, back to what the winner gets. He's rejected by his own brother. He's rejected by Saul. Saul actually says in verse 33, you're not able to go against him. You are but a youth, and he's been training for war from his youth. You, you, you get what's going on? He's been a, a warrior longer than you've been born. In Goliath, in verse 42, when he saw that he was but a youth and ruddy and handsome, he disdained him. Who, who, who are y'all? Do I look like a dog that you can shoo me away with a stick? I'm the champion, and I'm going to murder this guy. He's a rejected fighter. And yet he deeply believes in the Lord. God is out of the worldview of everyone there except for David. David is remembering. And he is remembered and he is readying himself to fight. He remembers that I killed lions and bears. And when they stood up against me, I killed it. And the Lord delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear. This big giant... He's like an ant in the economy of God. David believes God has brought me this far, too far to leave me. They don't believe in him, but David believes in his God. And the thing that I want to lay before you this week is that someone greater than David has come. There is a real four-headed dragon. Death, the world, your flesh, the devil. And I'm here to tell you that someone greater than David has come to do battle with those things. If you think that this passage tells you to be like David and conquer your giants, you miss the fundamental essence of the passage. This passage is about representative combat. Goliath is saying, I will fight and my people will be blessed by my fighting or you will fight and your people will be blessed by the fighting of your champion. The people are being represented by someone else. And so who are we in the story? We're not David. We're the people given over to fear. 
David is standing as a double representative. He represents God and he represents God's people. And this is why Martin Luther in that beautiful hymn says, did we in our own strength confide our striving would be losing? Were not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing? Do you ask who that may be? Christ Jesus, it is he. Lord of hosts is his name from age to age the same. And he must win the battle. And so you know your victor when you see the, vic the victor being patterned after David. And this is why it has to be Jesus. Isaiah, when he prophesies about Jesus, he says he had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He's like, David, like really, you, 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 you you're going to save the world. Isaiah says, yes, that's the reason Jesus is rejected. He was rejected by Saul, his family, and Goliath. Isaiah tells us he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Jesus' own family rejected him. And yet in Jesus, we see constant devotion to the Lord. I've come not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. Father, that glory I had with you before the beginning of our time, glorify me with that right now. I will go and die, and in three days I will be raised up. In other words, Jesus is confident not in himself, but he is confident in the power and the love and the work of God towards him. And Jesus comes to us, guess what, as our representative. He comes here sent as an errand boy from the right hand of God. Of, of God. He comes here as someone like you and I, yet without sin. He comes here as someone like you and I, and without sin, he comes here as being equal of God, the very essence of God. He is a double representative. We do have a victor who's unassuming and rejected. And we'll see in our third point, he wins. He wins freedom with his victory. A freedom is won through the fighter's victory. And this is what you see in David. Look at what happens when David gets there. It says he ran toward the line. He, there is no quit in David. He's not getting there and timid. He gets there and, and, and runs toward the battle. And he doesn't want the armor of Saul. He doesn't want the sword of Saul. He doesn't want the coat of mail like Saul. He says, man, just give me what I know. Let me get some stones and my slingshot, and I got it. And he strikes the giant in the head, and the giant falls. And then... He goes up to the giant and takes the sword from the giant and cuts off the giant's head with his own sword. That is so godfatherous gangster, y'all. And then he took his head to Jerusalem. And they didn't even capture Jerusalem. Jerusalem was not their city yet. He goes and probably puts the head of this giant on display in Jerusalem. And God has just proved his point. In the last chapter, God says, you men, you look at the appearance and the externals, but I look at the heart. And what David has just done is slay the giant who externally looked like he could not be defeated. And it was the Lord who worked through this man. And did you notice what happened? When David kills the giant, 
And the men of Israel and Judah rose with a shout and pursued the Philistines as far as Gath, and they wounded the Philistines. You get the image that they could not fight until their king crushed the giant. Now we can go fight. Y'all know that this is the essence and the aim of Advent. Jesus was not ashamed to be the father's errand boy. That he journeyed to this earth, that he took on flesh, and he ran towards battle. He set his face like flint towards Jerusalem. And there's a word play between Goliath of Gath and Golgotha. Something was going to happen in Jerusalem. And David was not going to put a head of a giant on display. Something greater would happen in Jerusalem later. Jesus will be lifted up. That his weapon of choice is not a sword. He told Peter, put down the sword. The way that we slay this four-headed giant is by dying. It's the only way to beat it. And the headshot that Goliath experienced is the mortal blow that has been struck to the head of the serpent. And the 40 days of waiting, that's Jesus. 40 days being tempted, 40 days victorious. It's us, it's where we find ourselves right now waiting on God to come finish what he started. And because your perfect and upright king has died, he has freed you. Death has lost its sting. Greater is he that is in you than the one who is in the world. That your flesh has been replaced with the spirit of the living God. And yes, your flesh tries to come back to life, but by grace you can put it to death. And this world, it has been overcome. That the four-headed dragon has been slain by Jesus himself. And when we get that, we can fight. We can fight now. It means that when you get the news that a loved one has died, you don't have to grieve without hope. You know that to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. You know that God himself has conquered death in the grave, and he will raise them up again. And you can look in the face of death And know that you will die and you will open your eyes and you will be fully alive and you will behold your maker and your king and you will enter into his joy forever. It means that when your flesh tempts you, you can actually recognize that it's temptation and you can flee or you can fight but you actually can do battle because your Lord and Savior has conquered. And it means when this world begins to allure you with all of its fancy entrapments, it means that you can proclaim that I have all that I need in Christ Jesus. And it means that when Satan sets his sights on you and the dark clouds of demonic attack come upon you, It means that you can stand and that you can resist and he will flee from you. 
And it means that when your loved ones who are going through life, who are paralyzed in a pandemic and not living and are afraid of everything, that you can actually open up 1 Samuel 17 and you can say, let me introduce you to a king who has slayed a giant and it's not David and it's Jesus and you can have freedom and fearlessness in him. And you can pastor your family. And you can walk with your friends in the valley. That's what I want for us this Advent. That we would know that we have a king who slays the giant, who mitigates our fear, who gives us freedom. And he was born to Mary. And he has struck a mortal blow. And he is soon coming to cut off the head. Let's pray. Father, I pray that your word would encourage the hearts of your people. Help us this day. Jesus, may we see you as colossal and beautiful and powerful. May we see you as having gone before us and have charted a way that this world, the flesh, the devil, and even death can no longer harm us. Give us this beautiful freedom for you are in our world and with us even in our hardship. We love you and we bless you. Amen. Let's stand and